Welcome back to Shoot the Shot, a brand new NBA and variety show. It is September 2nd, 2021. As always, I'm joined by my co-host Luke Sylvia, who just slammed a bowl of ice cream before we started. Oh, how, we, how we feeling? Oh, I feel great now that I've had that ice cream after a long day of work. You know, I go, I get a haircut. Uh, shout out Sport Clips, sponsor us. And also, uh, this it's this brownie cookie dough. I don't even know. Lauren brought it home. I told her you got to stop bringing home ice cream because what she does is she brings home the big carton. Uh, for one for her and one for me, basically. And she got her little mocha mudslide action happening over there. And I don't like anything to do with mocha coffee. I accidentally tried hers. And I was like, this is gross. Um, but I got my brownie cookie dough and I, it's it's pretty good. But I, I eat too much of it, I think. Yeah, I feel very differently. I know that you and our producer, Kevin, don't really enjoy coffee. Mm. I don't typically drink coffee because like it's just straight to the bathroom like every single time without mm. failure unless i'm drinking like black coffee like half of my day is just accounted for at that point mm. but coffee heath bar crunch i think it's a ben and jerry's flavor just phenomenal i will slam that all day kevin is probably cringing because i know he doesn't like coffee or heath like or <laughs> like toffee so he probably finds that disgusting but um yeah, always a good time. As soon as Luke jumped on the the call here that you know we're recording the the video for YouTube, I was like, this man looks like he just got a fresh cut at Sport Clips. And not only was I right about the haircut, I was right about the establishment that he got the haircut. So I'm two for two. Anyway, Luke, this week we're going to be breaking down the latest Ben Simmons rumors. Uh, there's some Twitter talk that we saw. We're going to break down, is Ben Simmons better than De'Aaron Fox, vice versa? Uh, we'll talk about the Grizzlies. They've decided to retire Zach Randolph and Tony Allen's jerseys. We'll talk about the uh, infamous high school that was in the news this week, or not really a high school, Bishop, uh, Bishop Sycamore. Mm-hmm. And then we'll talk a little Donda and Kanye West uh, towards the end of the episode. Here. And, so let's... and the, the, the other thing I want to do, Jonathan, first of all, I want to note that we did some college betting picks last week. Oh, you're right. You're right. We and didn't. You did. Yes. Correct. So I dished those out last week, and I made sure to let you guys know in the group chat your boy went 2 and 0 on the picks I put on the show. Illinois plus 7 against Nebraska, UTEP minus 10 against New Mexico State. Both got it done pretty confidently there. And uh this week I've got more. So we'll also talk about that. Um uh, if you guys are trusting me after that 2 and 0 performance, I'm sure I'll go, you know, 0 for 2 this week. So, we'll see. So you were asking me um I think it was you might have been might have been Kevin a few weeks ago asking about um if anybody was like doing a fantasy football league or anything like that and I told mm-hmm. you guys like I'd love to do a league with you guys but I promised myself after two seasons ago I had four or five fantasy teams and it was just completely miserable each each week I was like rooting for one of my teams and like rooting against another team and it, it just right. was not fun at all so I've set my limit two leagues that's it um, are you in a league? Have you done any of your fantasy drafts yet? Are you happy with your drafts? So I hadn't played fantasy football in two seasons now, um, but a friend came to me and said, hey, I'm starting up a dynasty league. Do you want in? And I, I had stepped away because I was so burnt out from fantasy football. I you know, I had played in a, you know, a couple years in a row with like three to four leagues, and I was like, no, I can't do it anymore. Like you, I swore it off. I played two. And I was like, nope, I still don't want to do it. Uh, and, you know, so now I'm actually I'm, I'm diving into a, a dynasty uh, fantasy league. So I, I look forward to picking Kyle Pitts number one. That's, that would be a <laughs> hu- huge mistake. No, so just quick story. So my the main league, I this is my fourth or fifth year. Mm. I the first year I was in it, I won the Super Bowl and I've been in the Super Bowl every single year. Now like the last three or four years consecutively I've lost in the Super Bowl. And this isn't like a second place you get like a consolation, you know, money prize. This league is cutthroat, it's winner take all. Mm. So I won the first year and I've just, you know, L after L after L in the Super Bowl the last few years. But like needless to say, I every year, you know, I'm one of the you know, best players, best teams in the league. So this year they wanted to switch things up a little bit and introduce keepers where you could choose right. one team, one player from your team last year, um, and you could choose to keep them. But with the caveat that if you select a keeper, you're losing your first round pick in the draft. So I ended up with the second pick in the draft, and I think my best performing player last year turned out to be Aaron Jones. 
I think he was like the second or third best fantasy running back last year. But mm-hmm. this year, he was ranked as like the 11th best player in fantasy, you know, if you ask the ESPN experts. So from a pure value standpoint, I was like, it's not a good idea for me to take Aaron Jones and keep him when I have the second overall pick. Now, with the second overall pick, I ended up with Saquon Barkley, who a lot of people know is coming off of an ACL, had an incredible rookie year with Eli Manning, uh, but with Daniel Jones as the quarterback the last couple of seasons, last year again, Saquon tore his ACL. But the year before that, you know, Daniel Jones is a lot more mobile than Eli Manning, where his rookie year, it was Eli would drop back, would have nothing, no no chance to do anything, and would just dump it off to Saquon. So in the PPR league, he was just an absolute animal. But I took him second overall, and because of those other folks lo- losing their first overall pick, um, the snake draft really starts in the second round. So I still had the second pick in the second round, ended up with Aaron Jones anyways. Mm. So had I had I took him, I wouldn't have ended up with Saquon Barkley, but pretty happy about my team. Uh, as maybe next week we'll dive into like what our fantasy teams look like and everything like that. But just wanted to share that with the listeners because I, I was I felt very vindicated in that moment. I was like, see that I didn't take Aaron Jones, ended up with him anyways. He was like the second or third best running back last year. Saquon, if he has a big year, he could be like a top five running back as well. My my big thing is. Running back, it's like the most scarce position in fantasy football. And in terms of value, I always go running backs, back-to-back first and second round no matter what. It's what you got to do. In my opinion, hopefully it's going to work out for me this year. All right, let's talk Ben Simmons. So I don't even know if we can really call this news. So it was uh, basically reported again that Ben Simmons wants out of Philadelphia. He wants to be traded. He's not going to have any contact with the organization. He's not coming to training camp. And everyone's talking about this the last couple of days. And I'm like, Luke, we knew this like a month ago. We knew that Ben Simmons wanted to be traded. Now, the other thing that I'm hearing is that Rich Paul is also saying that uh, Tyrese Maxey needs to be traded as well. He doesn't want any of his clients basically playing in Philadelphia. (laughs) Have you heard that? And like, what the the hell does Rich Paul (laughs) think, think he's doing if that's true? This I have is... no verification on that. I saw like one tweet, probably wasn't even from a verified source, but I saw that and like I got angry, Luke. Yeah. I'm like, this is what we're going to allow guys to do, a guy that's second year in the league because your other client wants out, now you're going to force a team to trade him? We're going down a dark road here. Yeah, I mean, but to be fair, right, like Ben Simmons, Rich Paul, like these are, I mean, they're talking to Maxi. Like they, they, that's where Maxi. Those are probably the guys he trusts most. So if Ben Simmons is having a tough time in Philly and whatever, unfortunately, Rich Paul basically has a monopoly in the NBA at this point. And there's that joke, you know, if they're signed with Rich Paul, they're going to play with LeBron. They're going to LA, um, which obviously like isn't really true, but it does speak it? to the, is it does speak to the fact that Rich Paul has a lot of leverage in this league. Because he can, he has so many players, and 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 Rich Paul just needs to buy an expansion team, and put all of his guys on that team because that, he's just ripping players away. And so I, if Maxi, you know, like I said, if Ben Simmons and Rich Paul are the guys that Maxi listens to, doesn't surprise me if Maxi decides, you know what, yeah, I'd I'd like out of Philly. You're going to you know, take my boy Ben Simmons and treat him this way, however he thinks he's been treated, and been maybe brainwashed to thinking he's been treated. Maybe there is some truth, whatever. It is what it is. And if Maxi wants out, maybe you can be a part of a, a package deal. Maxi, go where Ben goes. I don't know. Luke, at this point, I, I really think the NBA at a certain point needs to step in and because we're ha- we're seeing all of these guys like like Zion, you know, he just finished up like what his third year in the NBA, and people are or his second year in the NBA, and people are saying, "Oh, Zion already wants out of New Orleans." If if we cannot live in a universe where teams are able to sign guys that they draft in the first round to their rookie extensions without agents getting involved and trade rumors happening and guys, you know, demanding out, that is not a, a world, a universe, a league that I want to be a part of. If you if you go through all this trouble, like New Orleans, right? Yeah, they lucked into getting Zion Williamson, essentially, uh, with the lottery odds. But they just lost Anthony Davis. The Philadelphia 76ers, they draft a guy, I think, mid-first round. Tyrese Maxey's turning out to be a really good player. 
if you can't hold on to the guys that you're drafting, if we're not getting past like the third, fourth year before a lot of this crap starts, like honestly, what are we doing? We just drafted Jalen Suggs, number five overall. If a year and a half from now, two years from now, all of a sudden he wants out, I don't know what I will do as a as an Orlando Magic fan. That would be so bad for my health. I just think at some point the NBA has to make it more of an incentive for these guys that they draft to stay with the team that they draft. If that's not the case, at the rate that we're going, and this is just becoming a trend, 10, 15 years from now, you might as well just get rid of every small market team. You should just have, you know, like a, a European like super <laughs> league, like like they were trying to form, and just have like the Lakers, the Knicks, uh, the Heat, the Bulls, you know, maybe the Clippers, a few other teams. They should just have like seven or eight teams play in the NBA, and then we'll form another league somewhere else. Because it, it, it's really just getting ridiculous. I'm sick of it. Like the Zion stuff, who knows if that's really true. But if that's true, dude, it just it makes me sick to my stomach. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just it's the new age of the NBA, unfortunately. And I think that there's going to come a time where you and I are going to be the old heads talking about NBA. And, I, and it's going to be us just kind of yelling about – how things aren't the this way that they should terrible, be. This, this is terrible, man. This is terrible. These players these days, man, this is just <laughs> it's, terrible. That's pretty good. Um, yeah, but, uh, no, I mean, it, we're going to feel like, you know, the, the the fans of baseball, you know, those guys are like 50, 60 years old, the hey, old souls hey, of baseball. Hey, hey, Just because you don't like baseball doesn't mean other people don't no, like baseball. No, it's true. It's just like the, the things like bat flips, you know, the older people don't really like it very much. Me, I'm saying if you let me hit a home run, I'm flipping that bat over the stands. And I hope I'm hitting a fan with it. Like this is I'm I'm the, this competitive nature in me. I don't care that you don't like bat flips. You do like bat flips. The point is, I do think that the NBA could get to a point, and it is getting to a point. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of people from the '90s, fans from the '90s, who don't watch the NBA anymore for one reason or another. Well, whether it's politics and thinking they talk too much about politics, or whether it's you know players you know wanting out places, LeBron recruiting players and super teams. There's a lot about the NBA that is left to be desired now. I think there are some things that are unfortunate. But you give these players, you know, the money they get, and don't get me wrong, I think they deserve the money they get because it has to factor in with TV ratings. I mean, these guys are celebrities, right? So um, it's just what it is. And and the NBA is just heading that way. Players, you know, coaches don't rate. George Carl on the episode that we did here recently talked about that. Just the, the coaches don't have as much pull as they used to because the players are realizing what their worth is. And I think that's really what it is. I don't think it's really a problem per se, but, you know, it's it, it's you hear it all the time. You hear it all the time when it comes to, you know, when Luke Walton was coaching the Warriors, when Steve Kerr was out with like his was a back injury or whatever it was, you know, a couple of years back when Luke Walton stepped in, there was a lot of people joking around and stuff, but I think there's a lot of truth to it. Like, I think I could coach this team to do the record Luke Walton did. And now we're seeing Luke Walton's not that great of a coach. So there's there's some there's some correlation there. Don't get me wrong. And I know I'm getting off on a tangent here, but it's it, it really is that, right? Like the players are just controlling the league that much more for better or for worse. And I think that it's because they realize they're worth now. If it's not a problem yet, I'm telling you it's going to become a problem. I really think the NBA does need to step in and incentivize, um, you know, introduce incentives for you know teams being able to keep like these star players that they draft because if not after three four years it just seems like like we just went through this with Giannis like yeah he ended up signing the extension and won a championship in a championship in Milwaukee but there were plenty of times Malika Andrews made a report I think it was uh two seasons ago after uh Milwaukee lost um I think it was to the Philadelphia 76ers, if I'm not mistaken. She basically said, like, if the, the Bucks don't make the finals next year, there's a chance that Giannis is going to want out. And we're just going to see this over and over again. And the the large market teams are always going to be able to draw these guys. And the NBA needs to do something before it becomes a problem. So talk back to Ben Simmons. I saw this on Twitter. People were a small group of people. I'm not going to say it was all over NBA Twitter, but I, I found it pretty interesting Ben Simmons versus De'Aaron Fox. Who who is better? Because one of the destinations that they're talking about with Ben Simmons 
is potentially Sacramento and De'Aaron Fox and probably Tyrese Halliburton would probably be the two big pieces in a deal like that to make that deal happen. So, Luke, I wanted to ask you and get your opinion first. Who do, who do you think is better? Who do you think is more valuable right now, Ben Simmons or De'Aaron Fox? Um, I, I would. I think it's not really that close. I think maybe a year oh or two gosh. ago it was I close. I know what you're going to say here. I could not disagree more. I'm glad. I'm glad that you would disagree with this. But I, I think De'Aaron Fox is the younger player. I think he has a higher ceiling. I think he's just a better scorer. I think he is not as good of a defender. Don't get me wrong. He's not as good of a rebounder. Don't get me okay. wrong. You, you can't just say, like, oh, he's a better scorer, blah, blah. He's younger. He's not anywhere in the same stratosphere as a defender as Ben Simmons. Yeah, no, he's not. He's not. But when it, when it comes down to it, Darren Fox is still growing. De'Aaron Fox is, what, 23? Ben Simmons is 25. Like, Ben Simmons ain't 22 anymore. That jump shot's never coming around. Ever. Ever, ever, ever. We we talked about it for years leading up to this point. Ben Simmons doesn't seem to really be any more confident behind the three-point line. He's a great player, don't get me wrong, but I do think De'Aaron Fox is also a great player. I mean, he he's he's very talented, and I think that um, I just I don't know in a trade if I'm willing to give up De'Aaron Fox for Ben Simmons, who apparently can get disgruntled and 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 want his way out of things, and Rich Paul's whispering you know sweet nothings into his ear about his worth probably and whatever. Like I I just I I don't know that I can side with Ben Simmons and all of this. Not to mention, if you're thinking about giving up, you know, De'Aaron Fox for Ben Simmons, I, I could look very dumb if this trade happens and maybe Ben Simmons leads the, the Kings to be a better team than they are. But I just don't know that that's going to happen. So this is this is this is my argument here in uh, in Ben Simmons versus De'Aaron Fox. Now, I still think that Ben Simmons is the more valuable player. I still think he is the better prospect. I think when you look at Ben Simmons and, you know, both of these guys have played four years in the league now, just to give you, you know, kind of a, an update on their numbers from this past year, Darren Fox averaged 25 points per game, three rebounds, seven assists, one and a half steals. Ben Simmons uh, adversely averaged uh, 14 points per game, uh, seven rebounds, almost seven assists, 1.6 steals. So obviously Darren Fox right now is the the better basketball player, you know, putting the ball in the bucket at least. What I would say is what Ben Simmons and, you know, kind of the, what he's faced in Philadelphia, everyone knows it's been pretty obvious the last two, three years. He's not being optimized with Joel Embiid. He's not being optimized in the Philadelphia 76ers offense, really just being relegated to the dunker spot, you know, and, and, really not having the ball in his hands maybe as much as he should. De'Aaron Fox, on the other hand, I think everyone would agree he is being used optimally. Ben Simmons is being used suboptimally. De'Aaron Fox is always going to be best with the ball in his hands, which he does have the ball in his hands the majority of the time in Sacramento. And what I would argue is that Ben Simmons' elite skill right now, you know, Really, it's de defensively. He was arguably defensive player of the year this year. We know that he's a great playmaker. Uh, De'Aaron Fox is as well in his own right. Um, looking here at their usage rate. So De'Aaron Fox has a 31% usage rate, Ben Simmons 20, and they average roughly about the same amount of assists. So just logic tells me the more you put the ball in Ben Simmons' hand, his potential as a playmaker is going to rise. The assist numbers are going to rise. Um, so... If you want to argue that they're kind of equal as playmakers, that's fine. But defensively, that's where Ben Simmons shines. That's where his elite skill is. What is De'Aaron Fox elite at? Probably going to be transition basketball. Like, he is best with the ball in his hand, on the run. Right now, he's only having 4.8 possessions in transition per game. Um, and let's see, 56% uh, uh, field goal in transition. So we're talking roughly two and a half possessions in transition per game when he's scoring, when Ben Simmons is giving me like all world defense every single play. I do think that Ben Simmons in the perfect role for him is him as the primary ball handler surrounded by a bunch of shooters. Hasn't always been the case in Philadelphia. 
He's largely shared the ball with Joel Embiid, who you know plays back to the basket, but also plays a lot in the mid range. So I, I don't think it's totally fair to just look at their raw numbers and be like De'Aaron is clearly the better player. I think there's a world where Ben Simmons can still be put in the ideal situation. I don't know that that's Sacramento. I'm not saying that that's the case, but I think that Ben Simmons, if he was used optimally, we would look at him much differently than we do now. I don't know what team that is. I know it's not the Magic. I personally would not be willing to trade for Ben Simmons in that contract. The questions about his offensive game, legitimate huge questions, especially as it pertains to him being the best player on a contender or in a playoff series. Can you count on him to get buckets? Right now, you definitely cannot do that. But I'm still going with Ben Simmons. Anything that I said, change your mind whatsoever. Not really. Oh, no. come on. It was a better argument that you it, don't have to think about it for not even a second it, and a half. It was it was a good argument. It was You're very right, compelling. That he's not being used correctly. But until I see him being used correctly and see what he can become, I can't say that he's a better player or that he's going to be better than De'Aaron Fox. I just, I, I can't. I think that they're in the, Fox. He's a he's a anime fan, by the way. Shout out to Darren Fox. Even more so, the argument just compelled me even more. <laughs> um, I'm making the case against myself. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, I mean, I, I think Darren Fox is honestly. I, I think because he plays with for Sacramento, people also might not look at Darren Fox and even give him a, a chance against Ben Simmons. But the Ben Simmons slander has been high enough recently that maybe people put them on equal playing fields. I think that they are in the same tier. I think I think that they are. Um, I know they played the same amount of seasons. De'Aaron Fox being younger, though, um, still makes me think that he's got a, a little bit more to go. Ben Simmons, I, I think that De'Aaron Fox is, like I said, I think his ceiling's higher. I think that's all it is for me at this point. I think his three-point shooting can improve. At least he is willing to shoot the three ball. Ben Simmons is elite defensively. There is no doubt about it. But for me... Offense plays such a huge freaking part in the NBA, specifically shooting and spacing the floor. Ben Simmons, his whole career, it's going to have to be he needs he needs shooters around him. If you're going to build around him, by the way, I don't think that he's, like you alluded to, going to be the best player on a championship caliber team. You're going to have to always build around them, and you're always going to have to make sure he's got shooters around him. De'Aaron Fox, I think, is, is more available to kind of just put him on any roster and he can make that impact Ben Simmons there's a lot more opportunity for him to be used suboptimally than De'Aaron Fox to be used optimally fair enough and then I mean just when you look at the the contract of Ben Simmons like this year he's set to make 33 million dollars then 35 then 37 then 40 million dollars and like that that's a great point you plug De'Aaron Fox really into any situation he's going to be the De'Aaron Fox that we're seeing right now where Ben Simmons like you have to make sure that you're getting a you know a GM that's going to believe in making him the primary ball handler and really building around him so whatever i would still take ben simmons it's a, at this it's point a valid it a is vacuum. a valid argument and I, yeah. I don't think either of us is necessarily wrong it's just all opinion at this point because they're both you know fairly early in their careers all right let's talk some news from today so uh, the grizzlies announced they will be retiring zach randolph and tony allen's jerseys luke Thoughts on Zach Randolph and Tony Allen. Let me give you some some stats really quickly. Yeah. Other time in Memphis. So Zach Randolph, eight seasons in Memphis. Um, I believe it was yeah, two All-Star games, 16.8 points per game, uh, 10 rebounds, two assists. Um, again, eight seasons with Memphis. And then Tony Allen, seven seasons in Memphis, um, averaged 8.9 points per game, 4.3 rebounds, 1.4 assists, 1.7 steals, everyone know. Everyone knows that he was known as like a defensive stopper yeah. um, all across the league. Like that's that's what you're getting with Tony Allen. So um, those guys, I mean, three. Uh, let's see, yeah, 462 games for Tony Allen in Memphis, and then Zach Randolph, 551. Now, as soon as I saw those guys, um, the, their numbers are being retired by Memphis. To me, Mike Conley, Marcus All, automatic locks. Once they're out of the game, getting their jerseys retired. Both of those guys played like over 800 games for Memphis. So we can just like lock all four of them in right now. But what are your thoughts on, on uh, Zach Randolph and Tony Allen getting their jerseys retired in Memphis? I th- Honestly, I, I think that they are the the two best players at this point to who encompass 
Memphis Grizzly basketball of the last you know decade, decade and a half. Grit and so, grind. Yeah, it, they're they're grit and grind through and through. Both of them. Zach Randolph, extremely passionate. Tony Allen, we all know he's passionate. He 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 brings you know the grit for sure defensively, and that's really where he obviously, like you said, where that's where he locks in. I mean, I'm happy for these guys. I I think that you know Memphis, right? It's their first players you know that are having their jersey retired in history, right? Yep. So, yeah, I mean, I it's good for the Grizzlies for for finally you know getting the hint and starting to retire players' jerseys. I think it's something that every you know every franchise should do. Most have leaned into that. Um, us, you know, being Magic fans, I hope that that we are getting Magic jerseys retired um, sometime soon. Sometime soon, maybe maybe when Dwight retires, they'll start to sort of you know at least contemplate it. But unfortunately, I don't really think that we can count on that, um, just because of whatever criteria that's hidden away in a drawer somewhere at Amway um, <laughs> that has some type of criteria listed on that. I think when it when you talk about Memphis and you talk about the grit and grind teams. You know, like just year in, year out, you know those guys were going to be in the playoffs. You know they were going to be, you know, a hard out, you know, no matter what the case was. Um, but, you know, good for those guys, happy for those guys. But I'm on the same boat, you know, as you. I still I think it's, I think it's Orlando, the Clippers, and the Raptors are the only three teams in the NBA that have yet to retire a jersey, uh, at least for a player. The Magic retired the number six for the fans, the quote-unquote sixth man. Um so that's you know really cool. Happy for those guys. Um, yeah, Zach uh, Randolph, Tony Allen, and then Mike Conley and Marcus Gasol. Those guys won't be too far behind. Uh, especially Marcus Gasol, he looks like he's ending you know towards the end of his career. Mike Conley might still have a, a few good years left in him. But um, but Luke, let's talk Bishop Sycamore now. This is something <laughs> that you have looked into a lot more than I have. Mm. Uh, but there was some uh, some shenanigans going on recently. Yeah. So essentially, it. They played on ESPN. Um, I think it was over the weekend or on Friday or something like that. They, you know, tend to do that, especially when college football is getting into full swing. Um, but you know, I know that they had a high school game on Saturday morning around like eleven before the Nebraska game kicked off. You know, on ABC at like one or something like that. Bishop Sycamore, Jonathan, is a team who's not really a team. They they have guys on their roster. They played IMG Academy, which if anybody is from the Florida area listening to this, or if you know remotely about recruiting, IMG Academy breeds stars. They 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 breed football players, basketball players, anything you name it. They've come out of IMG, and IMG played Bishop Sycamore, and Bishop Sycamore had um it was a really weird coincidence uh not coincidence uh situation. He this this coach apparently Jonathan told was telling people ESPN or whoever it might have been we've got you know guys that are committed to play college ball places we're just as good as IMG type of talk and then they get on the broadcast and ESPN is like well um, we don't really have much in terms of their roster uh, some guy got hurt in the game for Bishop Sycamore and they're like number whatever he was we don't have his number he's not on the roster. He's not on the roster oh they gave me. Gosh. And uh, so, yeah, Bishop Sycamore swindled their way, and their head coach mainly, swindled their way onto national television. They've been playing in the past. They play little games. You know, they play games here and there against some top teams. I think they, they played some games last year and didn't win a game. Like, their coach is the epitome of a clout chaser, we would say. And, I mean, it, it was baffling. That ESPN, like that, these guys played on ESPN, and I think a lot of the, a lot of the criticism, everybody's like, "Oh, how did ESPN let that happen?" Well, it's really on the shoulders of the people that ESPN hired to vet the team. They had someone actually vet the team, and clearly, when it comes they to high school did football, not actually vet the team. They did not actually vet the team. They're like, "Hey, y'all, y'all legit?" And the coach was like, "Yeah." And they're like, "Bet you want to play Fire. IMG, bro?" It was like second quarter, forty-eight to zero. Or something like that. I saw the score. Just and unreal. aren't a lot of these guys like they've actually played college football? Yeah, yeah. Whether it was places. whether it was JUCO or wherever, um, they weren't as good as IMG. That's for sure. So you have to think what's going through the mind of a kid that's played JUCO, and then all of a sudden this grown man is coming. And you're like, yo, 
We're about to put all these JUCO kids together. We're going to play some high school kids. <laughs> We're going to get on ESPN. Like you have to kind of try to get in the mind of these guys that like what made them think that this was going to be a good idea. And yeah, absolutely. It def I'm right on board with that. Definitely on ESPN and whoever they hire to put this televised game together, they should be embarrassed. They should lose their job. Um, <laughs> it's crazy that things like that can still happen in 2021 in the world of social media where, you know, every big college prospect is all over, you know, huddle and max preps and all these different, you know, um, websites and highlight films. Like you almost cannot hide if you're an elite college prospect these days. So the fact that ESPN was just like, yeah, we have no idea who these guys are and (laughs) we don't know their names, but yeah, we're going to go ahead and put them on national television to play IMG Academy. And then IMG Academy they were just like, yeah, we've never heard of you guys. Yeah, you don't actually have a high school. You don't really have a roster. But yeah, let's go ahead and play on. We'll ESPN. kill you on like, national television. Yeah, just very, very strange. Yeah, um, I don't, I don't know. That was a, such a weird. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how it happened in today's day and age where information is so easily accessible. How that slips through the cracks, other than the fact that that place they did not care. Uh, vetting things and like they they did not they did not care at all that that's all right so sure. let's uh, let's stay on the topic of football obviously last week you know you talked about your two picks um I think it was Ilibra- Ilibraska, Illinois Ilibraska. over Nebraska and then it was a uh, UTEP over New Mexico State yeah it yep. was so you went two and zero what are your picks this week so this week I am going with uh, my first pick is going to be Minnesota plus 14. They're a two touchdown underdog to Ohio State. Uh, I'm going to go Minnesota plus 14 um, solely for the fact that Minnesota really the theme with why I chose Illinois last week over Nebraska was solely because uh, they Illinois had you know all of their returning starters while Nebraska did not. And it just made more sense. First game of the year, there's a lot of rust. Continuity is huge, beginning of the year. Minnesota is returning 20 starters. And Ohio State has lost a ton of talent, including quarterback Justin Fields, playing for Chicago now. Um, And I I believe also Trey Sermon, who was their stud running back last year. Um, So they just lost a lot of talent. I think Ohio State wins the game outright, but I I think it'll be a, a sloppy game. I don't think that they will cover 14 points. Um, I think that'll be a fun game to watch, to be honest. Um, Minnesota is always you know, a fun football team to watch. And then my second pick is going to be Kansas State minus three versus Stanford. Uh, it's a neutral site, but it's in North Texas. It's only a few hours from Kansas State's campus. Uh, I think that it'll be virtually a home game for Kansas State. They're just a better program. Not to mention their fans are going to travel there for the game. Skylar Thompson is a senior quarterback for Kansas I just think that it's kind of a no-brainer here. Kansas State, you know, minus three. I think that this line should be more like six. Um, so I, I think that you're getting good value with Kansas State at minus three. So those are my two picks, Jonathan. Minnesota plus 14 versus Ohio State. Kansas State minus three versus Stanford. So the only game that I really have a, a stake in this weekend is going to be uh, North Carolina taking on Virginia Tech um, right now. North Carolina is giving Virginia Tech five and a half points. Do you have an opinion on that at all? Can I can I go ahead and, and put some uh, some Benjamins down on Sam Howell and the boys this weekend or what? I think, uh, I mean, I really do like Sam Howell. Uh, I think they're favored by like five and a half, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, five um, and a half. So, and I was kind of eyeing that game. At Virginia Tech. At Virginia Tech. Um you know, the Virginia Tech is, if I'm sticking to the theme, honestly, Virginia Tech's returning a ton of starters. Um, but they, you know, there's a lot of things kind of working against them in terms of, you know, number one, UNC. Um, having Sam Howell at quarterback um, just is going to be a, a big, you know, one of the main picks at quarterback next year going to the NFL draft, I think. So I think that, you know, and this is the toughest game for UNC on the schedule from what I could see. This will be probably their one of their tougher games um, well, I mean, until they visit Miami until they Notre visit Dame Notre Dame is what I yeah. meant yeah so in the next you know month and a half this is really the only game or next month yeah month and a half this is really the only game that they're going to get up for I think um, and and really you know try to win this game convincingly first game of the year I mean I think you could see UNC win this game by by ten points or so um, I, I think that they could cover this five and a half point spread uh, but lock it in 
You heard Luke. I no, he that is not a, that, that is, or your money back. That that is not a pick. That is not a pick because Virginia Tech is scare it does scare me with it being at home, returning so many starters that they are. Um I think it'll be a fun game. I hope that your UNC Tar Heels win. Oh yes. And uh I think there's a chance that they cover, but I am I am that is a stay away game for me for sure. All right, Luke, we're gonna take a quick break and then we're gonna talk about Kanye West and Donda. Today's episode is sponsored by our friends at Manscaped, the leaders in below-the-waist grooming. It's back to school time, and we want to make sure you pack the essentials to have the best year yet. The Manscaped fourth-generation performance package is just that. Things are opening up. Be ready for whatever is in the daily schedule for you. It's the perfect package for your package and includes the brand-new Lawnmower 4.0. Fellas, go for the head of the class of ball trimming and join the 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com with the code 6th, that's S-I-X-T-H, at manscaped.com. School is back and the Performance Package 4.0 for Manscaped is here to teach the boys a lesson on male hygiene. Inside, you'll find their Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer, Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, Crop Reviver Toner, plus two free gifts performance boxer briefs and the shed travel bag this package includes the brand new lawnmower 4.0 and will give you the confidence to do anything you desire new year new you might screw around and attend smooth balls university this fall wait is that a thing get 20 percent off plus free shipping with the code six at manscaped.com that's 20 percent off plus free shipping with the code six s-i-x-t-h at manscaped.com this year, graduate with a degree in clean balls for Manscaped. All right, Luke. So basically, this weekend, out of nowhere, it seems, um, you know, kind of against Kanye West's wishes, uh, Universal dropped <laughs> the much anticipated uh, album from Kanye West, Donda. He basically tweeted out that Universal released the album without his consent, um, didn't include a few of the tracks, which I think to most streaming platforms like Apple Music, there are a few more tracks have been added. So mm-hmm. it looks like he kind of got his way. But um, I was driving from Orlando to Georgia uh, this weekend um, to pick you up my, peaches my kids. out of Georgia from Georgia? Yeah, that's it. No, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, so I uh, we were leaving in the morning. Everyone was on Twitter talking about Donda. So I put Donda on 27 freaking songs, by the way. Um, mm-hmm. At least that's what it was originally, yeah. or 26, something like that. I listened to the whole thing, Luke, and I, you know, you know what I felt? What? A whole lot of, eh, <laughs> eh, I just, I was not feeling it. Like, I feel like there was so much hype around this album. He basically toured the album before it even came out at all these different, you know, live stadium shows that he did. And I, I'm just very, very much underwhelmed. Like the production quality is exactly what you would expect from Kanye West. Absolutely incredible. The features are what you would expect from Kanye West absolutely incredible at least the names not every feature verse hit exactly mm-hmm. there was a, a few songs on the album where kanye was like actually spitting bars yeah and i would say since like 808s and heartbreak like we haven't really heard kanye west come out and like actually get on a record and spit like if you want to talk about like you know my beautiful dark twisted fantasy i really was not a, a big fan of that album again he's just changed he's become much more of an eclectic um, artist, if you will, he's more worried about a lot of the elements outside of just the lyrics. He's, ta- you know, really focuses on like the visuals and just kind of the themes around the album and the production, which obviously is a big, you know, big proponent. You know, it's a big element of any album. But I miss, I literally miss the old Kanye. <laughs> when Kanye says I miss the old Kanye, I feel that almost as much as I feel anything that he said on this new album. I, I think. Kanye what I did appreciate and sometimes it made you feel weird um he he really was reflecting on like his divorce with Kim essentially oh yeah and it made you feel everything for Kanye but also like I'm uncomfortable I feel like I'm in like your your therapy sessions right now and and that's what it is for him I think at this point I think his music is his therapy um all right hold on did you feel that way listening to take care the first time listening to take care of what that he was what that you felt uncomfortable not 
Not really. Hey, no, well, not, I mean, no, what is that if it's not a therapy session? <laughs> it's true. That is like that quite, is quite literally. Yeah. So with Kanye, man, like I, I think the, the beginning of the album was pretty strong. He started kind of, you know, interlacing Playboy Cardi being on the album was eh. Um, he was one of the first few songs, I believe. But uh, just not a fan of Playboy Cardi by any means. So, um, yeah, I think that the, the album was definitely underwhelming. But I think his whole delay of, of releasing it very much hurt the release itself. I don't care. I mean, I'm glad that, that they released it earlier than he wanted. Because it wasn't like, what else is he doing, really? I mean, I'm sure he made a Living lot of tweets. Living in the arenas. You know, right. Making in Mercedes-Benz updates. Arena. Yeah. yeah. So... Um, so I, I think that it was, I think there are some good songs on the album. I, I think that it's hard to have a Kanye West album and not be able to just know, you know, find some good songs. I liked, uh, pure souls with Roddy rich. That was one that I really enjoyed and probably was one of my favorite ones on the album itself. But yeah, I, I think his little delayed thing, playing the games that he played and just Kanye being Kanye, he never releases an album on time, but goodness gracious, it, he took forever. So I'm not uh, super pumped about the album. I'm only adding probably a few songs to a playlist um, as opposed to most Kanye albums where I'm putting the whole album um, maybe minus one or two songs on my playlist. So, yeah, I I think as far as Kanye's album goes, it's all right. I'd probably give it like a B. I would give it a B. Like it's not a bad album by any means. Like if if a normal person puts out this album, like if this is someone's debut album, we're like, oh, snap, like – this right. guy is legitimately like bursting onto the scene. Yeah. But this is Kanye's like, what are we talking like eighth, ninth, like studio release at this point. Mm-hmm. Like, and this is my thing. When you come out and your first three albums are um, college dropout, late registration, and then graduation. When you start your discography like that, Hot. you almost, you almost have no direction to go, but downhill from there. And also 808s and Heartbreak. I mean, he had... I, I still love that album. Me too. A I lot mean, of those... people didn't, but Robocop is one of my oh, all-time favorite songs. I love that song so much. And, and yep. it, yeah, no, I mean, his first four Heartless, albums... Heartless, yeah. Yeah, his first four albums from 04 to 08 were incredible. Um, have your opinions on My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy. He had still had some bangers in there. Power, just, all of the lights. What we've gotten into, uh, yes, it is. it still is a good good album. The emphasis was not on the lyricism like it was in the first three albums, at least. And that's why I say everything's kind of gone da- downhill right. a- after that. But um, like, just so, like, we're just in a hype beast culture now where guys like Kanye and Drake, no matter what they do, yeah. people just drool over these albums, even if they're not relatively good. Yeah. Like, I've got to say, Take Care, thank, thank Me Later, like two of my all-time favorite hip-hop albums... Like views from the six, I cannot tell you the last time that I listened to a single song from views, views from the six. Yeah. Now, if you're reading this, it's too late. That's a little bit different of a story. Like there are some legitimate bangers on there, and there are some good songs on views from the six. But I just feel like we're in this hype beat culture now, where some of the things that these guys do, it's like people just say they can do no wrong, and I see people hyping up the Kanye album like it's incredible. And I, I really just don't feel the same way. I miss the old Kanye. Yeah, yeah. I, like, I think... All Falls Down, I can, like, rap that word for word, <laughs> like, along with the song. Like, I remember coming home and watching that on, you know, TRL and, and 106 in Park on BET. Like, I would watch those, like, that music video over and over and over and over and over again. And it, it's just, I feel like a boomer. <laughs> I feel like a boomer talking about I miss, like, the 04, 05 Kanye. Um the, the college dropout is my favorite hip hop hip hop album of all time, but uh, and, and he showed us he showed us flashes of that. I forget what song it was, and there's 27 of them. And I was driving listening to the album, so I couldn't you know look up the lyrics and see everything that he was saying. But there was one song where he gave us like 30 seconds of him just spitting like actual yeah. bars, and I got so excited. <laughs> and like the last 40 yeah. seconds of the song was just complete nonsense. I'm like, right. what what are we doing here? Yeah. Um, so. Speaking of kind of wrapping up the uh, music section of this segment of this episode, Drake dropping his new album here. I love her boy. In two days, give me give me take care part two or I don't want it. <laughs> so give me it should give me be, take care part two. It, it should be uh, should be interesting. 
They, they kind of see. They miss the old Drake. Yeah, we'll see. Don't tempt me. We'll see. I mean, we'll yes. see because, like you said, we'll see if if people are just gonna hype up an album that's kind of eh for the artist standards, or are they gonna, you know, is it gonna be an actually good album? And you know, it's been a couple years here, so I expect it to be good. And and Drake, I, I mean, I I expect Drake to be good. He has transcended in time, been around for way longer than anyone thought he would be, staying relevant. I think that it could be a very good album. We'll see. They've been asking if I'm going to go platinum in a year again. Don't Michael Jordan still got his hoop earring in? Like, that's that's the Drake that I want. And this, mm-hmm. is my, this will be my last take about music because I've been thinking about this all day, you know, basically since I listened to the Kanye album. Like, the first few albums from any artist, when they're talking about their life experiences and they're so relatable and, you know, you really, you know, have like an emotional connection to a lot of these songs, again, because you can relate to what they're going through. After the third, fourth album, and this guy has a hundred million dollars, and you know sleeps in fifty-seven thousand count, you know Egyptian thread, you know bed sheets, and drives a diamond Lamborghini, and all these things, it becomes much harder to relate to these guys. And they just, at some point, you just got to start rapping about nonsense because you've spoken about all your life experiences up to this point. I right. went through this with Kanye, to with Drake to a certain ex- extent. Uh, Logic, Machine Gun Kelly, like a lot of these rappers, at some point it's just like the the music changes because they can't talk about the same things that they talked about on the first two or, th- two or three albums because they've already rehashed that time and time again. So it's like you have to find a rapper, listen to his first few albums, and then just be like, all right, it's over, we're <laughs> done. Let I'll enjoy what this was, but it, it's time for me to move on. And that's... I don't want to say that's what I have to do with Kanye because every album I get really excited for. Like even Jesus is King, right? Like it's largely like a worship album, right? I yeah. was really excited for that. But just like I love the subject matter, but it was just not what I expected in terms of like quality from Kanye West. Bro, I kind of I kind of love that album to be honest I with just, you. I just. I kind of did. Like, I'm one when of the When he few. starts spitting bars close on Sunday, you're my Chick-fil-A. What are we doing? Bro. It's a meme. It's a meme. That's not a hot bar. That's a meme. <laughs> yeah, it's a meme. I like that album though. But uh, all right, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, man. I mean, is there anything else you need to get off your chest when it comes I'm, to music? I'm console? sweating now. I'm get. I'm. I've gotten so. Speaking excited of giving about giving artists up, I had to give away you know Lil Wayne. So I I understand what you mean when it comes to giving up artists. I mean, you just kind of had to leave it leave it there. He just drank too much lean. Like, his whole voice literally changed. He does not sound like the same person anymore. I'm just glad that No Ceilings got released on Spotify, like, in publicly, like, a year ago. And they, they put all that out there because I it'll let me reminisce. I need them to do that with all the old Logic mixtapes. I'm still having to go to YouTube and freaking <laughs> dat piff. Dat piff, Luke, if I want to listen to an old Logic mixtape. And people are going to hate on Logic. When I, when I told Luke that I was a Logic fan, he was like, oh, my God. I was like, no, 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 no. You need to go back and listen to, like, the original, like, Young Sinatra album, like mixtapes, essentially, and he's got some legitimate bangers on uh, on those albums, like just rapping his behind off. So, Luke, that's all I got. Um, this is just turned into one big vent session. Hopefully, people are still listening. If you guys are. We really appreciate that. Again, we'll keep coming with these episodes every single Thursday. Appreciate your guys' support for Luke Sylvia. This has been Jonathan Osborne. You guys are listening to Shoot the Shot, and we will catch you guys next time. See ya.